I'm always so excited when the Zoom is actually working. <laughs> it's a good feeling. It's just not that easy. So you can see my PowerPoint screen, right? It says breast cancer overview. Yes, we can. Great. You don't need to see me, but you need to see that. And you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Everything's working. Great. Okay. Let's see. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, awesome. So. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so honored to be asked to talk to you today about breast cancer. It's October. Everything's pink in October with pumpkins. It's a weird combination. Um, and October is the time of year when we start thinking about breast cancer a lot. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a breast cancer overview, especially about breast cancer among Native American women with update, the most updated information that I could find recently. I have no disclosures, no funding. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, which is that I'm a member of the, an enrolled member of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. And these are images of the reservation, the last powwow that we were able to have a long time ago. This is in the northeastern corner of Kansas. And this is the ancestral chief. His name is White Cloud, and that's a George Catlin painting that is in the National Museum of Art in Washington, D.C., very famous. And this is his famous bear claw necklace that was lost for about 40 years, and then it was found. So that's about me. And also about me is that I've been doing breast radiology at the University of Michigan Hospital and Cancer Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for the last 29 years. This is our website of our um, radiology department and breast imaging, and this is our hospital. For the last 10 years also, I've been serving as a volunteer, not paid, but volunteering to be on the board of directors of the American Indian Health and Family Services Clinic of Detroit. Um, and that's been a very rewarding and fun additional activity to be involved in Native healthcare. I also got my vaccines there. They were the first to get the Pfizer vaccine, all three of them. And so I got my vaccine earlier here than I was able to get at this big monstrosity here where I work. Cool, huh? In 2003, uh, I was involved in an outreach screening effort about mammography at the McLaughlin Clinic in South Dakota and also the Rosebud Indian Health Service Hospital. And these are images of pathologists and radiologists that came to the clinics in those times to do actual mammograms. As you can see, that was the old days where I'm looking at mammograms with a uh, magnifying glass. 
And those are mammograms that were done that day of Indian women who had come to those clinics to have both their pap smears and their mammograms done on the same day on a weekend. So it was, a, it was like a collaborative screening effort to get patients in and get them screened for breast and cervical cancer. More recently, I became involved in mobile mammography and was the radiologist for the mobile mammography unit of the Great Plains Indian Health Service that operated from 2005, actually, till 2017, at which time it was discontinued by the Indian Health Service, probably for um, a variety of issues. One of those was costs, but the other one was it was so difficult to find truck drivers to drive the mobile unit around. As you know, there's a shortage of truck drivers in the nation and has been for a while. Now, unlike those old days in 2003, where I was looking at actual mammograms on a view box, on a light box, now we have digital mammography where we look at the mammograms on computer screens. And this is the type of mammography that was done in the mobile unit was digital, mammogra digital mammograms. In the early years, they could actually transmit those mammograms from the clinic, whether it was in South or North Dakota, directly to the University of Michigan Cancer Center and have the mammograms read within as short of a time as 30 minutes. Uh, and so this was a interesting project because it was doing mammograms from a distance, which was kind of miraculous. And the transmission by satellite only ended because it got too expensive. Uh, the satellite providers began to charge too much money for satellite transmission and, and in health service, as you can imagine, just couldn't afford it. So that's why the, the, the real-time transmission of images stopped, but they thereafter put the images on CDs and mailed them to me at the University of Michigan. And I was the radiologist who was in charge of this uh, operation for the FDA. You have to have a radiologist be in charge of every mammogram center uh, that there is. They don't operate by themselves in a vacuum. They have to have a radiologist who's the responsible party. And then this mobile unit traveled up to, well, thousands of miles all over. This uh, is a large area, as you know, among the reservations in North and South Dakota and also included parts of Nebraska and Iowa. So that was the mobile unit. And it gave us some data that we could look at and analyze with regards to mammography and American Indian women. So the early years, 2007 to 2009, we analyzed that there and found that at a woman's first visit to the mobile unit, unit the majority of women, or 60%, had had no prior mammogram in the previous two years. And these were women of mammogram age, appropriate to have mammograms, in other words, over age 40 years. But they hadn't had a mammogram in the previous two years when they came to the mobile unit. So that demonstrated that adherence to screening was only 40%, only 40% of the group was having mammograms. This is a much lower screening rate than national rates because the national rate of adherence to two-year screening mammography is around 75%. And that was published, uh, that data um, in that time. And then subsequently, the mammography continued in that same region from 2013 to 2017. And so we analyzed the data again, wondering did mammogram adherence improve compared to 2009? And here's an image of South Dakota. And you may have known Joel Begay, who maybe I think talked to you all last year, potentially in the October timeframe. Joel was a public health school student here at Michigan. And he helped me analyze the data of the mobile unit while he was here. And there's Joel and I, uh, I'm showing him what a mammogram looks like so that you can understand what we're doing. So Joel's moved on and he's in Colorado now, but 
I think in the near future, he's going to be at Johns Hopkins. So the results of 2013 and 2017 were the same as the previous study of 2007 to 2009, which is that this two-year screening rate remained low at 39%. And this indicated that there it was and is a persistent screening challenge in this location to getting mammograms. This manuscript is ju was just published in the journal Academic Radiology in July, if you would like to review it and use it for some for any purpose. Well, breast cancer issues among American Indians and Alaska Natives, there are several. So first of all, proportionally, more American Indians and Alaska Natives are diagnosed at younger age compared to the rest of the population. So it's younger women getting breast cancer more commonly than expected. Also, the breast cancer incidence and mortality rates vary greatly by the geographic location. And this doesn't occur in other racial groups. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. In other words, incidence and mortality don't vary by California as compared to Iowa or any other state in the United States. Everything is very similar, except in American Indians and Alaska Natives. Also, rural screening, rural areas have less screening and less access to breast care, but that's true for most anyone who lives in a rural area. And although deaths from breast cancer have been decreasing in white women and African American women over the last 20 years, the deaths, the death rates from breast cancer have only begun recently to decrease in American Indian women. So it's taken a longer time to see benefits of screening. Disparities also exist in surgical treatment by regions, which I'll get to later and show you some of that. Now, this is a relatively old data set from 2008, and it demonstrates that compared to non-Hispanic white women, who approximately 19% were being diagnosed at age less than 50 at that time, that a higher proportion of American Indian women were being diagnosed at younger age. Age less than 50, for those of you who are getting older, you know that's really young, right? That's young. And so as compared to non-Hispanic women, American Indian Indians in various locations, especially the Northern Plains and Alaska, and at that time, the Southwestern United States had higher rates of women being diagnosed with breast cancer at younger age. Now this data has been recently updated. So we have new data now, and it's similar again, the percent of women less than age 50 who are found to have invasive breast cancer is only is 15% in non-Hispanic white women but 22% in Native American women and 22% in African American women. Now, if you listen to the news about breast cancer much, you hear really a lot about African American women being diagnosed at younger age with breast cancer than non-Hispanic white women. But it's equally the same for Native American women, but you don't hear that on the news as much. Now, why are these data relevant? It's because, especially because there are screening recommendations for screening to start at age 50. So if you start at age 50, but a substantial portion of women are getting breast cancer before age 50, you're going to miss an opportunity for early detection among the younger group of women and that's also the group of women in which breast cancer is more aggressive as compared to postmenopausal older women. So starting screening recommendation at 50 is going to be too late for a substantial proportion of young women. And this is a, a very new graph from a, a very new publication that just came out. It's in Cancer this month or last month, September 2021. This is age distributions of breast cancer diagnosis and mortality by race and ethnicity in US women. 
So what this is showing, let me translate it for you and let me simplify the graph. The point is young women. So women up to the age of 50, okay? The black boxes down here are the rates of death of non-Hispanic white women. And the other colors over here are the other minority groups that they evaluated, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islanders, and non-Hispanic black women and Hispanic women. Those are the other colors. So the um, Native American women are in purple. They're right here. And you'll see that actually all of the um, minority group women have higher death rates than white women, which are down here. And that the minority women are kind of clustered very closely together, very similarly in um, the death rates at age less than 50. And in the news, oftentimes you hear more about African-American women and breast cancer as if they were the only minority group that had health disparities. But as you can see from this, younger women of minorities, of, uh, of all minorities have higher death rates versus non-Hispanic women. Uh, this is a study done uh, uh, several years ago, published in 2014 about Michigan women. And this was found, it was determined that in American Indian women, same thing, a third of cases of invasive breast cancer occurred at age less than 50 in these women. And there was a 50% higher incidence in the age group less than 50 as compared to white women of the same young age group in Michigan. So here's the thing, to not screen American Indian women under age 50, which is the U.S. Preventive Task Service, uh, Service Force, I get that mixed up. Uh, anyways, the USPSTF recommendation, official recommendation that dooms more American Indian women to having cancer detected later. A long time ago, um, look at this. This is, we're looking 1999 to 2003. That's a long time ago. I mean, my kids were little back then. That's, I mean, young. They were in junior high or something, middle school. Uh, so that seems like a long time ago to me, 1999 to 2003. And you'll see, even at that time, this demonstrated that American Indians, depending on what group they were living in, Alaska, Southern Plains, Southwest Pacific Coast. They had wildly different uh, incidents of breast cancer as compared to non-Hispanic white women over here. You can see that no matter what region the non-Hispanic white women were in, they had very similar incidence rates of breast cancer. But Amer among American Indian women, the incidence rates were very different depending on where you live. So that was a long time ago, right? That was virtually 20 years ago. And here's an updated graph of that same concept. This uh, graph has been made by Dr. Judith Tower, who I'm sure you all know, um, affiliated with Mayo Clinic. And this can be found at this website if you want to go look at it yourself. And she also shows other cancers, not just breast cancer, but lung cancer and liver cancer and other cancers are on this website, but I'm targeting breast cancer for you all today. So this is what we're discussing. And you'll see that among non-Hispanic white women, this is the light gray bar here. The incidence is, is almost exactly the same no matter where they live. Very similar incidence rates, except in the East, it's a tiny bit higher. But among American Indian women who live in various locations, the incidence of breast cancer is much lower in the Southwest than in the Southern Plains, interestingly, where it's higher. Um, I gotta move this little box, I can't see, there we go, there. And also it's fairly high in Alaska. So this again demonstrates what was shown in that previous graph in the year 2003, that there's variation in incidence rates in American Indians by where they live. And the reason for this is totally unknown.
no, no known reason for this. Now there are challenge, challenges in data about American Indians, Alaska Natives and breast cancer. Some of the challenges are a lot of national studies that you will read in the literature. It's so frustrating because they actually combine Native American data with other minority groups. I've seen Native American data combined with Asian women's data, Asian women living in California and Seattle and those places and being Chinese, Japanese. And it's like, why did you put all of that data together? Because you're so lazy that you don't wanna segregate it out so that the rest of us can see what the differences are. That's a pet peeve of mine. Don't combine Native American data with other groups of people. And then also studies often combine all American and Alaska Native data into a single one category. But you can see that there are dramatic differences in incidence and outcomes by tribe and by region. An additional problem has been racial misclassification in both medical and death records over the last many years, but there has been a lot of work to improve the racial classification in medical and death records. So we're getting much more accurate, better data now than we had in the past. Well, let's look at breast cancer incidence rates in American Indians. How did it change or did it change between the, the turn of this century, the year 2000 and 2015? So what happened overall is that the incidence rate went up 8% in Native women while going down 10% in white women. And also the incidence rates were higher in certain locations like we've shown you in these graphs, such as the Northern Plains, the Southern Plains and Alaska as compared to non-Hispanic whites in the same location. The mortality incidence ratio, which is a, a peculiar ratio, you, you determine rates of death divided by rates of incidence. And what that actually gives you is a prognostic factor, like are more dying than living with breast cancer or are fewer dying than living with breast cancer. So die, live. Um, and this showed that the number of deaths compared to having breast cancer, that's the mortality incidence rate, is higher among Native women than other women, which in itself indicates worse survival than other racial groups from breast cancer. Now, this mortality incidence ratio actually went down by 40% in um, white and Black women, and I can't see the bottom of my screen, oops, well, it was I can just tell you it was going up in Native women, but I can't see that number right now because I moved my screen so down. Hide thumbnail video, can't move it. All right. Um, now let's look at um, some other data. We know that there are screening access disparities by geographic area. So it depends on where you live, whether it's easy or hard to get screening for breast cancer and how far you have to travel. We know that mortality rates of breast cancer have decreased in all other racial groups since 1990. Beginning in 1990, mortality rate of breast cancer started to go down for everybody, but did not begin to decline until two decades later in American, in, oh, American Indian and Alaska Native women. Um, mortality rates similarly were um, declining among all other women from 2013 to 17, but during that time period, didn't budge at all in Native women. There are higher mortality rates of breast cancer in the Northern and Southern Plains and Alaska than, oops, than American Indians in the Southwest and dramatically different too. So, um, much worse mortality, that means more deaths in these locations than in American Indian women in the Southwest. These are unusual and you can ask me why, and actually I don't know why, because nobody's figured it out quite yet. 
Native women have a 1.3 times greater chance of stage three breast cancer. Now, maybe that doesn't sound like so much, except that's actually 30% higher chance of stage three breast cancer. That means the cancer is no longer just in your breast, but it's now not only in your lymph nodes, but somewhere else most likely too. And Native women less than age 50 have a 1.46% greater risk of invasive cancer compared to non-Hispanic white women. So that's like half as much more. So more data, early stage breast cancer, this has to do with surgical treatment. American Indian women and Alaska Natives have more mastectomies compared to non-Hispanic white women. 41% have mastectomies versus 34%. So that's like a 25% increase over sort of baseline. Also, there are fewer lumpectomies that are done, especially in the Northern Plains as, and also Alaska as compared to non-Hispanic white women who are getting more lumpectomies than mastectomies. Now, this could imply either of two things. One is that you don't have access to surgeons who are doing lumpectomies or they're too far away, or you're not a candidate for radiation therapy, which you have to have if you get a lumpectomy because you live too far from radiation therapy. So this could be due to either rural problems or higher stage of disease. Like if you have more bigger breast cancer, in your breast, you can't have a lumpectomy, you have to have a mastectomy. Or if you can't get to radiation therapy, then you have to have a mastectomy. So this phenomenon could be related to either of those two, re two reasons. There are also higher rates of late stage breast cancer in American Indian women and Alaska natives versus non-Hispanic white women. So check this out, Northern Plains, late stage cancer in the same region in white women, it's 15 versus 20. In Alaska, 18 versus 25, Southern Plains, 21 versus 17. So these are disparities in worst stage of cancer. Let's look at the mammography rates in Native women. They aren't well known. We don't have a definite way of measuring them. And there isn't much, if any, literature in the publications, medical publications about this. It seems to be a difficult thing to figure out. But um, we do know that based on the telephone survey, which, you know, that overestimates who really had uh, mammograms because people forget. They think they had a mammogram just last year, but it was really three years ago. So when they call you on the phone and say, did you have a mammogram last year? Then you say, yes, because you thought it was last year, but it was really a long time ago. So the surveys are very sketchy, but it's always been lower in American Indian women than non-Hispanic white women as far as when they had their mammogram and if it was in the last two years. So that's the telephone survey. Now the Indian Health Service does measure two-year screening rates for the ages 52 to 74. And this is based on what's called the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommendation because this is the screening age group in this type of recommendation for mammography. Now this is based on actual medical records and not based on survey. So the Indian Health Service does have data on screening rates among their patients. Now you probably know, or maybe you don't, that all the different societies have somewhat different recommendations about screening mammography. There's the American Cancer Society recommendations, which are different from the American College of Radiology and from the American College of OBGYN. The latter two organizations typically recommend annual screening, not biannual screening. And then the American Cancer Society has a complicated one. Whereas the preventive task, task, US Preventive Services Task Force recommendation is every two years mammography after age 50. Oops. 
Let's go back one. So we don't have any national or comprehensive screening data available for American Indian women. All we have is really the Indian Health Service screening rates or the telephone survey rates. And in the Great Plains Indian Health Service, as I told you, this, the two-year screening rates were low at about 39% based on mobile unit data. Indian Health Service data of, of 2017 among all Indian Health Service regions, the two-year screening rates were 55%, but did vary by what region and facility was reporting it. By comparison, the U.S. national two-year screening rates are for Black women, 81%, and white women, 81%. So um, American Indian women are still low on screening compared to other ethnicities. And here's another disparity. So access to breast imaging facilities is more difficult for rural women. And this study that was published in 2014 found that American Indians have the longest mean travel times to mammography facilities of any group of women in the United States. So this map demonstrates the um, reservations, which are in color, so you can kind of see them right here where the reservations are. And then the map that I tried to superimpose onto it is where you can get mammograms. So in a lot of places where there are reservations, like here's one right here, Arizona, this northwestern, northeastern corner of Arizona, there isn't available mammography. There are tons of mammography facilities in the east. They become more spread out and sketchy when you get in the western and midwestern United States where a lot of the reservations are. So access to mammography is difficult. And then if we wanted to talk about breast MRI, then things get really very sparse for women living in Indian reservations. So let's just take something like here's McLaughlin, South Dakota, maybe right there, MRI, well, forget about it. So you got to drive, you know, from here to there or here to there or here to there. So it's a long ways to get to MRI for American Indian women who live on reservations. And breast MRI is becoming a, a very great tool in detecting breast cancer early. So that is a disparity right there in access. And this uh, same study didn't have a had a graph that demonstrates that Native American women right here had the longest travel times to mammography and MRI of any other ethnic group. And this is for, oh, this is MRI, sorry, this was mammography. Oh, mammography and MRI, I've got them together. And uh, this is also travel time to MRI of greater than 30 minutes. Native Americans, 84%. So it's hard to get to the screening you need when you live a long ways away. And there maybe isn't a real good solution for that yet, but maybe someday there will be. Now let's talk about breast cancer in general. The three most dangerous things in life, pretty much, are breasts, cars, and guns. And the, these are data from 2014, but the same data are the same way if we looked at them now. I just haven't updated the slides. So 33,000 people died from cars, 33,000 from guns, and 40,000 from breasts. Breast always seems to exceed either cars or guns in killing people, which is kind of surprising, isn't it? Because we think of these and they are really dangerous. And these are also really dangerous. And these are also pretty dangerous. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird to be talking to myself here. I can't hear anybody like laughing or whatever. All right, so breast cancer, you know, how do we find it? We can find it by palpation, just by feeling it, by images with mammograms, ultrasound, or MRI. Those are our best tools from finding it. And do these things really help to find breast cancer early? Yes, most definitely. And this is a graph that proves that screening mammography decreases breast cancer deaths by 50% 
And this is multiple, multiple, multiple studies all over the world. So breast cancer, uh, death from breast cancer is definitely reduced by screening mammography, even in, back in 2012, when mammography has gotten even better since 2012. So mammography is doing a really good job. It's not perfect, but it's doing well. The greatest improvement in life saved and life years gained is annual screening mammography beginning at the age of 40. Now that's evidence proven, that's evidence based. It's not me just giving my opinion, it really is. And here's an article to back that up in Cancer 2017. All right, so who gets screening, when to start, how often and with what technique? You know, there are different recommendations from different organizations. So that makes it very confusing for a lot of women. But, um, and here are some of those recommendations. They're different for each one, but we as radiologists strongly feel like age 40 is the time to begin mammograms and to screen every year regardless of what your risk is, whether you think you don't have any risk, whether nobody has it in your family, you just can't tell. 70% of women who get breast cancer don't have a family history of breast cancer, so you can't really go by that. The number of lives saved per year by following age 40 screening, rather than the US Preventive Task Service guidelines, which is start at 50, would be 10,000 women, supposedly. And in computer models, annual screening beginning at age 50 gives women the greatest benefit of the greatest years of life gained from screening mammogram. So we strongly feel like age 40 is good to do and do it annually. As I said, of women who get breast cancer, 75% have no risk factors and only a very small proportion have genetic risk, such as the so-called BRCA1 and 2 genes. The main risk is being female, getting older. And there are a few things you can do to decrease your risk, such as breastfeeding, a lot of it, exercise, a lot of it, early age at first birth, like age 15. And then there are medications that can also reduce your risk. Now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about when you get screened and when you get called back for additional imaging. That means you need either more mammograms or you also need an ultrasound. So out of 100 women who get screened, 10 will be asked to come back for additional screening. And out of these 10, three will have a biopsy, but maybe only one or two will have breast cancer. So. Don't be worried about when you get called back from screening for additional imaging. Now, another risk factor is actually breast density. And you've probably been hearing a lot about breast density in the news because a lot of states have laws about it. This is a non-dense breast. This is a fatty breast. You can see everything really well. This cancer is so obvious. You don't even have to be a radiologist to see it. These other breasts are dense and cancer is white and it can be hiding in these breasts, very hard to see. Now, we can't prevent breast cancer unless we did mastectomies. And you know, some people do get mastectomies like Angelina Jolie because she had the gene for breast cancer. So she got mastectomies. But can you decrease your risk? Yes, you can. I told you this already, exercise a lot. Um, use the Mediterranean diet. It's a vegetarian-like diet. Uh, cabbage is good. Cabbage family vegetables are good. Limit or eliminate alcohol. And then breastfeeding so decreases your risk. And if you have a lot of children and breastfeed them all, that will really decrease your risk a lot. But you'll have other problems. So... Um, what is the evidence that screening mammography works? I presented you some evidence, and this is an early study that demonstrated between 1992 and 2009, the rates of um, breast cancer deaths definitely went down. During just that time period, 30% fewer women died of breast cancer. The rate also slightly decreased in American Indian women, but not much, it was rather sketchy. 
Now I've talked a little bit about density of mammograms and that does limit detection of breast cancer on uh, mammography. But there are also other things we can do. There's this thing called tomosynthesis, there's ultrasound, there's MRI, and there's lots of mammogram data over the years. It's a very evidence-based procedure. The only real harm of screening mammography is anxiety because patients get quite anxious, but oftentimes, but the harm of not screening is death or disability. Also remember every woman's breast is different than anyone else and there is no one normal because actually mammograms are sort of like fingerprints. Everybody's is very distinctive from everybody else's. Radiologists read the mammograms and they have training that's about 10 years, at least 10 years after college and doing this. So they're very experienced generally and do the best that we can. Now, why do we talk a lot about breast density? Oh, oh no, why do we talk a lot about prior mammograms? Well, they're really important. Let me show you. Here's a prior mammogram. Maybe it was 2014 or something like that. Here's 2016, and it's easy to see that there's something there on that mammogram when you're looking at the prior. But if you're not looking at the prior, you might miss seeing something like this, and you might be distracted by something here or something here. But when you have the comparison mammogram, that really helps the radiologist be more accurate. And the more comparison mammograms you have, I guess that was 2015 on that one, the easier it is to find a breast cancer quick and early. So this is another reason why annual screening is a good idea. Because if you only get your mammograms every three or four years, you're hoping that that radiologist is not missing anything on your mammogram. Because then if you're not coming back for three or four years, then it could grow and get bigger. But if you get mammograms every year, the radiologist has a lot of comparisons to help them figure out if anything has changed or if it's abnormal. So we're big fans of annual screening. It makes interpretation a lot more accurate. Now, here's another point I wanna make, which is that don't be scared of mammograms. Don't be scared of biopsies. Don't freak yourself out. This is a patient who was 45 years old. She had her first screening mammogram and it's impossible to see it, but there are tiny calcifications, only a few right there when she came for her mammogram. So we scheduled her for a needle biopsy because calcifications can be a sign of super early breast cancer. And there they are. She was so scared of the idea that she might have breast cancer, even if it was just minimal breast cancer, she did not come back for her biopsy, but she came back 15 months later because she felt a lump. Da, 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 da. So this is her mammogram 15 months later, and she was proven at this time to have high-grade invasive cancer and positive axillary lymph nodes. So it may be hard for you to appreciate the change on the mammograms from this mammogram when she just had six or seven microcalcifications right here. And now do you see all these many, many, many tiny dots? I don't know if you can see them, but there are hundreds, hundreds of them thousands of them now, just 15 months later. So don't be scared of a biopsy. Don't be scared of what might come out of your mammogram because it can save your life. Now, being recalled from screening does make you anxious, but the majority of recalls turn out to be normal. Also having a biopsy recommended makes you anxious, but most, the majority of biopsies are negative. Not detecting a cancer early may cause much more anxiety because you'll have more difficult treatments with larger tumors if you have your breast cancer detected late. Now let's talk a little bit more about dense breasts. Up to 60 to 70% of women have what we call dense breasts. That means they're really white like this. It's like a snowstorm in Wyoming and it's hard to see cancer in these types of breasts, it is. And if we do an MRI on that same patient I just showed you in the left breast, you will see on the MRI easily that she's got a breast cancer right there. And on the mammogram, it's like almost impossible to see it. It's right there, super hard. So dense breasts are really challenging because for the radiologist, 
there's all kinds of hidden abnormalities. This is like my this is my grandson's uh, Lego desk that he made his Legos on. And so it reminded me of the clutter of a mammogram. Like, how are you going to find something in this clutter of black and white and gray? If it were in color, you could find it more easily. But in black and white and gray, it's hard to see things. It's challenging. So again, here's a breast cancer. It's white. And in this non-dense breast, really easy to see. But this cancer, if it was in this breast, it would be like a seagull in a white snowstorm sky, you just would have a really hard time seeing it. So when breasts are dense, the mammograms are less accurate. They're like 50% accurate. And here's some other examples of different densities in breasts. Everybody's got kind of a different density pattern than everybody else. And all of these breasts actually have breast cancer, but it's hard to see. There's that one. That, there's that one, a little bit more obvious in this one. In this one, it's probably right here, hard to see. In this one, I have no idea where the breast cancer is, but we know it's there because we can see abnormal lymph nodes in the axilla. And so there are breast density laws now in many states that say that patients have to be informed of whether or not they have dense breasts. And that helps them know that they actually need to come regularly for their mammogram and not skip mammograms in between so that radiologists have a better chance of catching their cancer because in a dense breast, it will be hard to see. It's like, um, I told you there is a cancer in this breast, but I can't see it because it's like this image of the horses in the snowstorm and the end in right here. Um, now you can see the fox really well because it stands out, but the horses and the Indian man right here are more subtle and that's how patterns are in the breast as well. Now we can make slices in the breast so we can see images much more clearly. This cancer, which is uh, evident on this tomosynthesis image, which is slices, this irregular spot right there is really invisible on this mammogram, but we can see it really well in this um, way of doing mammograms now, which is called tomosynthesis, which is like slices of the breast. So now you can see that's much better than that, right? You can see that a lot better. So tomosynthesis is also an important advance in mammography. Now in closing, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what are the radiology tools and how good are they? And we literally have three tools. The hammer is maybe your mammogram. The screwdriver is your ultrasound and the wrench is your MRI. We have all these tools. They're pretty good. And so I'm going to explain, try to have this image explain the differences between them. So let's pretend this big red ball. These are all the breast cancers Okay, in your city or in your village, all the breast cancers, just this red ball represents that number of breast cancers. Okay, the white space is all of the people who have no breast cancer, or they would be false positive biopsies if they were biopsies, but the white is no breast cancer. Okay, this green shape here is demonstrating that palpation of the breast will detect cancer, we know it will. So look at this, it can detect this many cancers, but it also detects this many nothings that are not cancer, like cysts. So that's what palpation does. Now, how about mammograms? So mammograms detect a lot of breast cancers, but not all of them, see? It doesn't get all the breast cancers but it also detects a lot of other stuff that isn't even breast cancer. So that's mammography. Now superimposed on this, I know this is getting confusing now, this is ultrasound. Ultrasound also detects all by itself, a lot of breast cancers, but not all of them. And it also detects a lot of other stuff like this pink out here is in the region of the breast cancer out here, but it's finding stuff. And finally, this is breast MRI, the most expensive of all possible um, imaging methods. And this does detect almost all breast cancers. Maybe it doesn't detect three or 4% of them, but it detects all the breast cancers, but it costs a lot of money. 
But besides that, it detects a whole bunch of other stuff, like what was this whiteness out here that's not even cancer at all. So that's why we have all these different imaging methods to try to decancer cancer because no one of them is perfect. All right, so um, I already talked about this, how to save your life. If you wanna know more information about mammography, you can go to this website and the confusion. And here's something that's coming along in the future maybe is cryoablation for small cancers instead of excision or lumpectomy for women over the age of 65. This might happen in your region in the next several years. And here are some publications that I've had with regard to breast cancer and American Indians. So there you go. How about questions now? I only gave you eight minutes for questions, but I've just answered your questions to a million things probably. Questions? It looks like we had one in the chat earlier today, from, or earlier this hour, from Catherine Leggett Barr. Um, and I think it was on the, um, when you were talking about the disparities in um, AI, AN cancer versus like the white population. Um, and her question was, are there any hypotheses as to why this is the case? Is it the result of differential screening rates, differential risk factors, or is it truly unknown? So um, there are no, there is no science that explains why there are different rates of breast cancer among different American Indian groups in different regions. Some people have hypothesized maybe it's late age at first birth um, or differences in you know having your babies or breastfeeding. Other people think it's probably genetic somehow, but the genetics hasn't been studied at all. So no one knows why breast cancer incidence varies so much by tribal region. It's absolutely not known. It's absolutely not investigated yet. It's a good question. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, it is very interesting. It's a great mystery. I mean, I've been seeing this mystery for almost 30 years, well, no, 20 years in American Indians about nobody knows why it's so different. It's more different among American Indians than it is between America and Japan, right? It's wow. just weird. Um, we have another question on disparities from Martina Jesperson. Um, are the disparities between rural and urban, are there disparities between rural and urban American Indians? And if so, can you speak to that? Um, so for one thing, well, the incidence rates do vary by tribal region, but I don't think that has been analyzed as far as what about rural versus urban, even in a tribal region. So say you live in Shiprock, New Mexico versus Phoenix and your native? Is there a difference in your incidence or risk of breast cancer between Shiprock and Phoenix? No one's investigated, it's just among um, Navajos or Hopis, for example. And no, that hasn't been uh, investigated or published. Um, in general, urban women have better breast cancer survival rates. It's also true, this is a little paradoxical, urban women have slightly greater incidence rates. And that's because they have delayed age at first birth, whereas rural women tend to get either married sooner or start having children sooner than urban upwardly mobile women. But then on the other hand, in indigent urban women, many of those are having children at very young age as well. So age at first birth is actually a very strong predictor as to your risk of breast cancer. And if someone would analyze it more and better, I think they would be able to figure out that age at first birth among American Indians may be a key thing that's causing the differences between regions and tribes. 
that's my idea. Makes sense. Um, so lots of research to be done out there still. So. Yes, there is. There's a lot of research to be done. Um, Gail Heda says, Dr. Rubido, thanks for all the information and easy to understand wording, recent breast cancer in my family, and I have better knowledge of our experience. I agree you've done a really good job of making all of this really easy to understand. So I wanted to give people some data and information, not just preach to the choir, if you know what I mean. Say, oh, screening's good, mammography's good, but you need data, you need actual science, not just cheerleaders. Yes, that's what I want it to be. Definitely. And I think at one point you mentioned not knowing if anyone was laughing. And um, I know I was laughing throughout and I, Misha from ACAF as well messaged that she was laughing too. So I just want to also give a shout out to AICAF because you have you guys have been so durable and so persistent and gone through a lot of changes over time, right? And you are what I would call staying alive, staying alive, staying alive and doing great, doing great work. And you just keep on going. You are the energizer, energizer bunnies. Thank you. Um, it's a great place to uh, work and get good information from. So yeah. Um, and thank you for joining us today. It's marvelous. Yeah. Oh, I have a new article that was just accepted for publication um, in a radiology journal that's coming out. It's on American Indians, breast cancer, liver cancer and lung cancer so it's all cancer it's kind of like the three big ones right now because the whole nation is unaware of this epidemic among american indians and for liver cancer is just crazy really serious right yeah yeah lot that to be, be really interesting to look for so thank you yeah it's coming out i'll let you know well, you know, it won't really be in print for a couple of months, but I'll let you know when it comes out and you can um, get that. And everyone everywhere needs to be publishing more information about our people and our populations because it's sort of hidden. We hear about African-American women and breast cancer all the time, like constantly, like how bad it is in that population. But when you look at the actual data, it's similar in young Native American women. It's just not talked about as much. It's not brought up as much. So that's why I was bringing it up. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, it's really important to bring up. So. Okay, well, um, I'll, let you, I'll uh, go back to your dinners and anyone can email me. You probably, you have my email so you can provide anybody my email. If somebody wants to talk more, I'll be happy to talk. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye-bye, everyone, for being here. Bye.